Hi, my name's Andy Baker and I've been an ecologist in the area for nearly 20 years and today I'll be talking about restoring the Byron Bay Clay Heath. Firstly I'll outline what is the Byron Bay Clay Heath, why is it important, why is it disappearing and finally how are we restoring it. The Byron Clay Heath is a low heath vegetation, usually ankle to knee high and mostly comprised of grasses and other grass like plants and heathy shrubs such as Banksia and Casuarina. It's restricted to low clay hills along the eastern edge of Byron Bay. To get your bearings, at the top of the photo is Main Beach at Byron Bay and Tallow Beach to the right, and the circle in the middle there is the water tower on top of Patterson Hill. Recently a similar sized area of related heathland has been identified west of Cabarita on the Tweed coast. Clay heath can exist in one of three states, either as a typical heathland with no overstory. This is what dominated most of the hills to the east of Byron Bay before European settlement and up until the 1960s. It can occur as a heathy layer below woodland. This originally occurred as a narrow ecotone on lower slopes and gullies. And finally it can occur as a heathy layer below open forest. However, if the canopy becomes too dense, say above 60% cover, the heathy understory is shaded out. This type was also originally restricted to lower slopes and gullies. So why is the clay heath important? Firstly, heathland on clay is generally rare because it can transform to forest if fire is excluded for several decades. It has a very scattered distribution along the east coast, occurring as tiny pockets at Coolham in southeast Queensland, this occurrence in Byron Bay, at Evans Head, large expanse in Urigir National Park totalling around six to seven hundred hectares, also down at Southwest Rocks and a small extent down in Crowdy Bay National Park near Taree. The Byron Bay Clay Heath is listed as an endangered ecological community because it has a unique floristic makeup found nowhere else and it is in rapid decline due to past clearing, vegetation change and environmental weeds. At the time of European settlement, the community covered around 75 hectares, shown in yellow. The orange area shows its current extent, however most of this is under encroaching forest, leaving only the dark red areas of original open heathland at around only 5% of its original distribution. The Byron Clay Heath contains two flora species found nowhere else on Earth, including the Byron Bay diurus, a terrestrial orchid known from less than 50 individuals, and during the last two years of comprehensive survey, only one individual has been found. This species is a post-fire specialist and it is hoped numbers will increase after planned fires. The dwarf heath casuarina, which in the Byron Clay Heath is thought to be a new species, different to the dwarf heath casuarinas elsewhere, the heathland also supports a population of pink nodding orchid of around 300 individuals, one of the largest populations in New South Wales. The heathland is also home to numerous threatened fauna, including the Wallum sedge frog, eastern chestnut mouse, which favours recently burnt habitat, and the Queensland blossom bat, which is a small fruit bat about the size of an egg that forages on the nectar of banksias and paperbarks in the heathland. The clay heath was also maintained by the burning practices of the Arakwal Aboriginal people. It's believed they would have burned it every 5 to 15 years to keep trees out, making it the most intensively managed vegetation in Arakwal country. But why manage it so intensively? It's likely it was burnt to create green pick and hunting grounds for hunting wallabies and kangaroos, but also maintain important plant resources found nowhere else in the landscape. Its location also allows views over all of Arakal country, including Broken Head, Bangalore, Kurabil, Mullumbimbi and Brunswick Heads, and is likely to have had high cultural and spiritual significance. So why are we losing the clay heath today? Encroachment is the main cause of clay heath loss, where it is being displaced by invading forest and fernland. This encroachment is being caused by reduced fire frequency, stormwater pollution, soil disturbance and environmental weeds. Now let's look at the process of forest encroachment into treeless ecosystems. 
This is the typical heathland structure with a ground stratum of grasses, sedges and heathy shrubs. In between fires, young trees may recruit into the heathland. Historically at about this time, a fire would pass through the community, removing all the young trees and restoring the original heathland structure. However, in the continued absence of fire, trees continue to develop and if a fire passed through at this point, many of the trees would survive. This represents the passing of a critical threshold, making restoration of former structure with fire alone impossible. With continued fire exclusion, the trees continue to develop an overstory above the heathland and shade intolerant understory plants begin to drop out of the community, as can be seen in the bare areas in the right of the photograph. Continued canopy development continues to suppress understory vegetation. At this stage, rainforest trees are starting to recruit into the understory, dispersed by fruit-eating birds, who can now perch on the shaded trees. And the rainforest seedlings can recruit without competition from the heathland plants. At this stage, the flammable ground stratum has completely disappeared, making the application of ecological burns virtually impossible, and the developing rainforest trees now encourage dispersal of environmental weeds such as camphor laurel, umbrella tree and ochna. In the absence of fire, coral fern also encroaches the heathland. Coral fern is indigenous to this area, however with long-term fire exclusion it rapidly smothers all heathland vegetation, and where coral fern has encroached for a decade or more, Heathland seeds in the soil may also become exhausted and even fire may no longer stimulate heathland recovery. So how fast are we losing it? The yellow area represents the extent of open heathland in 1966. Moving forward nearly 30 years and the red area represents encroachment of forest and coral fern. And by 2012 we've lost almost 66% of the heathland extent. If we plot this, we can see a steady decline and potential extinction of the heathland in around 20 to 25 years. However, the restoration program will arrest this trend and restore heathland to much of its former extent. So let's look at the process of change from the air. These are areas where encroachment has been accelerated by stormwater pollution. In the north, from the water tower overflow outlet, and the south, from residential stormwater drain. This is an aerial photograph from 1966. You can see the water tower on the left of the picture and the red dot represents the overflow from this tank. The yellow line represents the um, extent of the impact from the stormwater plume. In this picture note to the right of the photo, the tree line and everything to the left of that row is heathland vegetation without any trees. Moving forward to 1994, and you can see coral fern, the bright green areas, starting to establish in the stormwater plume, but also the line of paper bark trees is gradually moving up the hill and scattered throughout the plume. And then moving forward to 2012, and the paper bark trees have started to coalesce to form a closed canopy in many areas, and the coral fern has continued its expansion over the clay heath. Now looking at the area adjacent to Pacific Vista Drive, this is before the subdivision was put in place. The red dot represents the, uh, again the stormwater outlet and the yellow lines represent the extent of the stormwater plume. Again note in the top right hand corner of the photograph the texture of trees and the extent of the tree vegetation and the relatively smooth texture throughout the rest of the photo is heathland. Now moving forward to 1994 and we can see the bright green areas of coral fern beginning to establish in the stormwater plume and also the um, rapid growth of fairly large trees, mostly swamp box and paper barks. End of 2012 and the coral fern is continuing to expand over the clay heathland and the trees are continuing to recruit and um, form a dense canopy over the original heathland vegetation. So looking at an area uh, without stormwater issues but only with the absence of fire, again photograph in 1966 and the area delineated by the yellow line is all heathland vegetation. Again note the texture of trees in the top right hand corner and along the bottom of the photograph. 1994 and trees are beginning to encroach that area and by 2012 um, some of those areas of former heathland are now forest and uh, there are small trees throughout all of the remaining heathland. So how do we restore the clay heath? 
in 2013 in Arakwa National Park a restoration management plan was written. It states the primary aim being to restore them to the maximum degree possible the extent, structure, function, dynamics and integrity of the pre-European Byron Clay Heath and associated woodlands and forests and the habitats they support. The main overriding strategy is to restore the original site conditions being uh, firstly uh, to apply frequent fire or most importantly we'll talk about um, staging in a moment um, every 5 to 15 years to remove stormwater pollution and to reclaim lost areas of heathland by removing encroaching trees. So looking firstly at applying frequent fire um, fires have been undertaken in uh, restoration burns in three areas in the clay heath to date. Uh, this map shows uh, the areas here in red that have been um, restoration fires that have been undertaken in the last seven years uh, and the yellow and orange areas have proposed for burning over the next three years. Looking at the minimising stormwater pollution, the uh, stormwater overflow from the water tower in the top of the photo, that has been um, diverted um, several years ago, so the process of encroachments generally stopped down there, and the Pacific Vista Drive plume down in the lower end of the photo is uh, currently, redirection of that is currently being negotiated with Council. However, reintroduction of fire and stopping stormwater stops further to climb, but it doesn't reverse encroachment. So what about the established trees? So removal of encroaching species is basically a reversal of the encroachment process, and its primary objective is to restore light to the understory. And um, in doing this, uh, the intention is to save the heathy understory from further loss from shading, to also encourage a flammable understory, um, and most importantly, the removal of these trees is considered to be a one off intervention and that the community will be maintained in its appropriate structure by fire alone after this intervention. So, the first stage is removal of uh, rainforest trees from the mid story and removal of weeds and this process alone uh, encourages a certain amount of um, regeneration in the understory and then the our next sweep is to come through and to progressively thin the canopy to specification be it open forest, uh, woodland and um, in some areas ultimately to heathland. So this removal of the overstory just that increased light um, allows for a certain amount of uh, regeneration of heathland plants. So looking at restoration extent, quick reminder this is the area that was lost between 1966 to 2012 and this is the extent of target community so yellow being open clay heath, um, orange being woodland with clay heath understory and the red area is forest with clay heath understory on the eek turns. So looking quickly at some of the early results of restoration works, this is an area that was previously closed forest dominated by um, Potosporum and Camphor Laurel and very weedy also, very limited heathy understory. So after both fire and removal of encroachments it's now got an open forest structure and heathy understory is regenerating nicely. This is an area uh, of conversion of woodland back to heathland, so removal of the woodland trees to give an open heathland structure. And here's an example of conversion of low forest to heathland. These trees are in the order of two to three metres tall, so fairly low, but becoming increasingly uh, taller as you move away from the camera. And this is restoration now and good recovery of the heathland understory. And finally here's an area of coral fern and restoration ultimately to heathland um, including pr primarily a fire in this case but also removal of encroachments. Um, the heathland had smothered nearly all of the, uh, sorry the fernland had smothered nearly all of the heathy plants in this situation so regeneration was uh, entirely from seed uh, so the process has been very slow but 
um, as you can see a ground stratum is now regenerating and producing lots of seed. So from this point um, a fire through here would be, another fire through here would be expected to um, stimulate very uh, dense heathland recovery. So I'd like to finish by highlighting the process of vegetation change with fire exclusion is widespread throughout Byron Shire and the wider region. This is an area of wet heathland in Brunswick Heads Nature Reserve. The fine textured area within the orange line is treeless vegetation and beyond the line forest and tall shrubland. Moving forward 30 years without fire to 2012 and you can see forest and tall shrubland has displaced much of the original heathland vegetation. Looking too at um, an example of Themata headland uh, grasslands um, which is also an AEC. This is the extent in 1994. The orange line um, shows the extent which you would map as Themata grassland. And moving forward now to um, 2012 and you can see large areas of that grassland have been lost and the process continues with small trees uh, cropping up right throughout. Finally, I'd just like to mention that around a thousand flora species have been recorded for Byron Shire, and around a third of these are shade intolerant species below a metre. And it is this group that is most vulnerable to localised extinction with vegetation change and shading that is becoming widespread across the region without fire. So, this is a process that's happening in our open vegetation communities, but also um, with uh, rainforest uh, mid story development in our um, previously open forest communities. So uh, a big emerging uh, biodiversity conservation issue there. So thanks for listening.